Hi, welcome back to Carbohydrates in Biochemistry. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. All right, so in this video, um, actually we're gonna do a couple of videos on this, at least a couple. What we're gonna talk about are aldohexoses and ketohexoses. After that, we're gonna to move to talking about aldopentoses and then ketopentoses. And we're ultimately going to discuss how cyclization occurs. So what is cyclization, if I was to define that? Cyclization is when you have some molecule that's in a linear form, and it undergoes an internal reaction to become cyclic. So for example, before we get into the details of it, here I have the linear form of D-glucose. Okay, this is D-glucose on the top. Notice it's linear. It's not how we normally draw it in its cyclic form. Okay. However, this linear form can undergo cyclization, which is non-enzymatic. It happens spontaneously without an enzyme, but it can go and form a cycle, a six-membered ring. Okay. Fructose, right here, the defructose, is in its linear form. It can also undergo a cyclization reaction and form, in this case, a five-membered ring. And we will talk about why things like that happen and how it happens. Now, in a previous video, we went over Fisher projections of carbohydrates, and Hayworth projections of carbohydrates. Hayworth projections are these that are shown here on the right side of your screen that you see, and these right here are Fisher projections, okay? Um, I'm gonna assume you already have a knowledge of those. If you don't, go back and watch that video on those or those videos, but we're gonna go from Fisher projection, which is the linear form, typically how we draw it, cyclized to a, a, a Hayworth projection, okay? Let's talk about the aldohexoses first. Now this is for aldohexosis, and in general, they're gonna work the same way, okay? So I have glucose here. We could be very well be dealing with mannose or galactose, okay? Something like that, aldohexosis. So when you look at the number of carbons, we have one here, two, three, four, five, six. The reason it gets the name a hexose is because there are four carbons. Or excuse me, six carbons, I misspoke, six carbons. That's why it's called a hexose, all right? Now, the first carbon, number one at the top here, sometimes they will abbreviate this as CHO. A lot of times when you see CHO, that's designating an aldehyde. And thus, it's given the name aldohexose. So if I was to actually draw out that aldehyde, it looks like this. Okay? And in fact, that form of drawing it out, like you see here, is going to be more useful for showing why certain things happen. Okay? All right. Now, one of the things that's really important is we do have aldohexoses and, ket and ketohexoses, all right? Aldohos aldoses or aldohexoses stem from the fact that the position right here, there's an aldehyde, okay? Ketoses or ketohexoses stem from the fact that this position right here, which is not the same position, it's actually position two, is a ketone, two different functional groups. Glucose has the aldehyde up here, fructose has the ketone at position two. Either way, they can cyclize because the ketone and aldehyde are fairly reactive, okay? So let's go over how the cyclization occurs and then talk about why it occurs. And I'm just gonna show you first and then we'll explain why. So the linear form, the Fischer projection, there's an oxygen here, this is position five. The oxygen, what it's going to do is it's going to attack this position right there. And that's ultimately what's going to lead to the cyclization. Again, I'm not being mechanistically rigorous, but you could have a question on the test that says which oxygen and glucose, the Fischer projection, reacts to form, to, to do the cyclization. And that would be position five hydroxyl group. Some people may be tempted to say it's position six, the one below that. It's actually not six, it's actually position five for glucose. When you do that cyclization reaction for glucose, you get a characteristic six-membered ring where one of the atoms in the ring is the oxygen. Okay, the oxygen, that's this right here, which atom is that in the Fischer projection? That is actually this oxygen right here because it's the one that did the nucleophilic attack. Okay, this oxygen that's on the anomeric carbon which one is that in the Fischer projection? That is actually this oxygen right there. 
Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. That's just identifying where things are. Um, one thing that's really important here is the fact that instead of just naming it beta D glucose, I'm being very specific and saying beta D glucopyranose. We talked about pyranoses and furanoses in another video, a previous video. A pyranose is a carbohydrate that has a six membered ring. Furanoses, like the one shown below, are carbohydrates that are stable in a five membered ring. Okay? So just clearing that up, this is a six membered carbohydrate ring. It's a pyranose. Here is an important question. Let's talk about why this happens. Okay? Why does this happen? Well, Number one, why is it this oxygen that does the attack and not the bottom one? Well, this is something you kind of have to think about a little bit, why this happens. If you do this with this oxygen that's in pink and you do that, you get this beta D glucopyranose. Okay? I'm just going to go ahead and tell you this. I won't show you, but you just have to take my word on it. If I instead use this oxygen right here as the attacking species and do the same reaction, what you'll actually get is a seven-membered ring. A seven-membered ring. Okay? And in fact, if I do it on, I'll do it on this oxygen right there, you get a, a five-membered ring. Now, why don't, so the question is, why don't you do it on this bottom oxygen, the one in yellow? The reason is because you get a seven-membered ring. If you think back to organic, remember your cyclic structures, which ones were the most stable? Six-membered rings tend to be the most stable. Five-membered rings are still relatively stable. Six-membered rings are more stable than five. But if you start going to four-membered rings and seven-membered rings, those are not stable at all. They're really not. Um, four-membered rings have a lot of ring strain, a lot of it. Seven-membered rings also have some. So the tendency here is going to be to form six-membered rings and five-membered rings. But six-membered rings are the most stable, so that's why glucose is most stable in the six-membered pyranose form, okay? And that's why this happens, okay? So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And also what can happen is you can also have a decyclization that occurs, okay? You can actually decyclize from the cyclic form back to the linear form. But the equilibrium actually favors the cyclic form. It's favored in the cyclic form. The other thing also is notice I have this anomeric carbon drawn in the beta configuration. The beta is also more stable than the alpha. If you need more detail with beta versus alpha, go back and watch that video. But suffice it to say beta is more stable because there is more hydrogen bonding in the beta configuration of the, of the anomeric carbon. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now let's go and look at the same thing, but do it for a keto hexose. The keto hexose I'm going to look at is fructose, defructose. The question is, how does the cyclization occur? Okay, so this is how it happens. I'll just go ahead and tell you that fructose is most stable in a five-membered ring. So it turns out that the atom that is going to do the attacking, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, is actually this oxygen right here. Now if we go and number them, we have one, two, three, four, five, it is also position five on fructose, just like it is on glucose. So this is going to attack this carbonyl, the ketone carbonyl right there, and that's ultimately going to lead to this cyclization, but fructose has a tendency to be more stable in the furanose form. And furanose, recall, furanose means a five-membered carbohydrate ring, and this is beta because this OH group is going up, just like this hydroxymethyl group. So this is beta. Beta is also more stable than alpha. Alpha fructose is not as stable. But suffice it to say, fructofuranose forms because the five-membered ring is also more stable for a lot of the keto hexoses. Okay? The six-membered ring tends to be more stable for the aldohexoses. So if they ever asked you, if you have, a, if you have a, a keto hexose, would you most likely find it in the pyranose or furanose form? You would most likely find a keto hexose in the furanose form, the five-membered ring. If you have an aldohexose, you would most likely find it in the pyranose form or six-membered carbohydrate ring. And just like in the case of glucose, you can also have a decyclization reaction back to the linear form. 
Okay. And but just like in the case of above, the cyclic form is a lot more stable than the linear form. Okay. So the linear form is going to be not as favored, so you're mostly going to find it in the cyclic form when you find this floating free in solution. But just like in the case of glucose, the beta form is also more stable than the alpha form. Okay? So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. And that is some of the details on these. Okay? If you had instead attacked, done the nucleophilic attack with this oxygen right here, position 6, you would get a six-membered ring, but the tendency for ketohexosis is a six-membered ring is less stable than the five-membered ring. Okay, and that is just something you have to take my word on. A lot of it has to do with the fact that this is a ketone and you actually end up producing this extra hydroxymethyl group, which in the five-membered ring can also hydrogen bond and add some extra hydrogen bonding, making the five-membered ring more stable. We're not gonna look at that structurally, but when you have a six-membered ring from a ketohexose, this group no longer exists, and so there's less hydrogen bonding overall, okay? So five-membered rings for um, ketohexoses are more stable, okay? So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. In the next video, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna compare aldoses and ketoses, but do it for ones that have five carbons, so pentoses. All right, so hopefully you enjoyed this video, learned a lot. Make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. And in the next video, like I said, we're going to compare aldo and keto pentoses and look at more cyclization reactions. See you in the next video.